while all wolves have many things in common, each wolf population, each pack, each individual exhibits variation in its behavior and characteristics. The more we learn about wolves, the more we understand that they are complicated creatures. The ambassador wolves at the International Wolf Center in Minnesota are great examples. They provide opportunities for us to consider the lives and habits of wolves from different parts of North America, as well as our evolving understanding of their genetic diversity. Hey everyone, this is Mike Fitz, your resident naturalist with Explore.org, the world's largest live nature cam network. Welcome back to Explore.org and this live chat. We're here to discuss wolves today and specifically the diversity of wolves in North America, including uh, the newest member of the International Wolf Center's Ambassador Pack. And my guests to discuss those topics today are Lori Schmidt, from the, who is the wolf curator at the International Wolf Center, and Abby Keller, a wolf care specialist and educator at the center. And the International Wolf Center advances the survival of wolf populations by teaching about wolves, their relationship to the land, and the human role in their future. You can also watch their ambassador wolves anytime by going to explore.org. Uh, Abby and Lori, thanks so much for joining me today, and I'm, I'm looking forward to our conversation. Great, thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. If you have questions about wolves for Lori or Abby, please uh, drop those in the chat below the live camera feed. You can find it down below the thumbnails, uh, below the live camera feed. A helpful moderator, Brian from Explore.org, is searching for those questions in the chat. So we'll try to get to a few of those during our conversation today. Uh, Lori and Abby, though, to begin, uh, let's, let's talk about subspecies. I, mean, I know that uh, 2021 was a busy year for you as you introduced a new wolf into your exhibit pack. And we'll talk about her story a little bit later on in the broadcast. Uh, but uh, let's uh, introduce that, that idea of a subspecies because we were kind of talking about different things that we could discuss during this live chat a few weeks ago. And the wolves that you care for at the Wolf Center are representative of different types of wolves from different places in North America. And broadly speaking, I sort of define a subspecies as a, a category of biological classification. It, it subdivides a species, especially when a plant or animal uh, varies in its physical characteristics or is isolated by geography. And gray wolves, they ranged all over, you know, much of North America, much of the Northern Hemisphere uh, historically, but not all wolves are the same. The status and number of subspecies of wolves is widely debated among biologists. Some scientists have argued that there are dozens of wolf species across a worldwide range. Others uh, disagree and say there are far fewer. Uh, so can you uh, enlighten me and, and uh, maybe uh, I should just ask you, why might that be? Why the variation? Sure, I can cover that. Um, initially in North America, if you look at Dave Meech's first book called The Wolf in 1970, kind of the authority on wolves, um, they had listed 24 subspecies in North America. And um, that was really done by morphology, the skeletal structure, how they looked, uh, where they ranged. And, and what happened since then, in 1995, um, genetics really came into play. And a lot of uh, biologists argued, how can you have four different subspecies in Alaska when they disperse and travel 500 miles, you know, or in some cases, a thousand miles in their travels? You know, how can you say that they're different? And so uh, genetics kind of came into play, a little bit of realism about uh, wolf travel. And uh, what they did was they came up with five subspecies uh, in North America, which was the graph that you that you just identified. Uh, we here at the Wolf Center have three out of the five, Arctic subspecies, the Northwestern subspecies, the Great Plains. And then the other two subspecies are the uh, Mexican wolf and the Eastern uh, timber wolf, which is a little bit uh, marred in science right now. And actually let's talk about the Eastern timber wolf for just a little bit. That one has, uh... That type of wolf has a bit of a messy taxonomy. Um, some uh, scientists will say it's it's a subspecies mm -hmm. of gray wolf. Um, others, uh, other research says, well, maybe we want to think about this a little bit more carefully, mm -hmm. looking at some of the genetics. It seems like there's a, at least some people who will argue there's evidence uh, to separate out the eastern timber wolf as a separate species of canid. So uh, where are those wolves found and why do scientists debate whether they constitute a unique species or just a subspecies of gray wolf? Sure. Yeah, I can take that one. So the eastern timber wolf or the Algonquin wolf um, is actually out of kind of the southeastern part of Canada. 
uh, kind of specifically the Algonquin Provincial Park area, kind of by Toronto. Um, currently, they don't have a very big population. There's about 500, um, less than 500 or so. Um, and like you said, it is pretty debated on whether it is a subspecies of the gray wolf, so Canis lupus lycon, or its own species, uh, Canis lycon. Um, you know, the reason why this is, is a lot of what Lori mentioned that, um, you know, basing their taxonomy decisions or their classifications based off of morphology or the, those physical traits. Um, but those, you know, new genetic research and those new uh, methods that we're using nowadays, uh, we're able to look a lot closer into the genetics of the animal um, and learn a little bit more about its past, little, learn a little more about, um, you know, kind of what makes up that species um, and how it is distinct from other species or subspecies um, in of the same animal. So, it has that genetic research um, made any or revealed any clear distinctions, or has it really muddied the waters when we're thinking about the eastern timber wolf as far as um, its separation out? Yeah, um, you know they've kind of found out that there are. There's a much higher percentage of ancestral coyote genetics in the Eastern timber wolf genome uh, compared to other gray wolves, um, gray wolf subspecies uh, found in North America. So if you look at the Northwestern uh, gray wolf um, out west in Alaska, British Columbia, Western, all of Western Canada pretty much, even down into the Rocky Mountains where it was reintroduced, um, you see pretty much no uh, ancestral coyote hybridization uh, within their genome. However, if you look in the eastern uh, species and subspecies of wolves in North America, you see a much higher percentage of that uh, ancestral coyote DNA. So if you look at the red wolf, which is another species of wolf, um, I believe it's around 70%. Um, they have a, a pretty high content of um, you know, ancestral coyote DNA and similarities with coyote DNA, whereas the the eastern wolf is somewhere around 50 to 60 percent, um, and even the Great Lakes wolf, the the wolf that we have here in in Minnesota where we're located, uh, they have around 20 to 30 percent. Um, so there is some some evidence of that ancestral hybridization and. You know, in my opinion, I think it kind of muddies the water a little bit more, just because when do you draw that line of uh, what percentage of ancestral DNA um, from coyotes is going to affect whether it's a subspecies or a species of of those different um, different kinds? So, and I personally think that yeah, the, uh, examining the genetic diversity of you know species like wolves is quite fascinating when you get into the to the nitty gritty details like that. What uh, at the International Wolf Center, you do have examples of different types of subspecies of wolves um, in your uh, the animals that you care for. Uh, and we'll talk about um, each one of these uh, wolves uh, over the next several minutes in particular, because I think, you know, w maybe their stories where um, their um, their, gen their genes originate from are, are quite fascinating in its own right. Maybe the first one that we should talk about happens to be Grizzer. He's actually an ancient wolf of the Great Plains subspecies. So can you introduce us uh, to Grizzer and maybe talk a little bit more about what sets the Great Plains subspecies apart from other wolves in North America? Sure, so Grizzer is uh, 17 and a half years old. Uh, he, um, uh, with being a Minnesota subspecies, uh, wolves were delisted or were, were protected in Minnesota uh, with the Endangered Species Act of 73. And so their their uh, longevity in captivity, uh, their likelihood uh, was that they've been in captivity for a while, meaning that there's, um, you know, there's probably a, a longer history of uh, them being bred in captivity. And so um, the differences, I think, with the Great Plains subspecies Coloration, certainly they seem to have that kind of grayish, uh, sandy color. Um, they call them the nubilus or Great Plains subspecies. If you envision what was running around the Great Plains, a little bit of that grayish coloration um, blends well with the forest. Uh, so camouflage is a big part of subspecies. And, um, um, you know, so grizzer is a good representation of that. Mid-range wolf, meaning typical wolves in the Great Plains are, you know, 50 to 60 up to 100 pounds. Obviously, captivity is best biological potential grizzles 115. 
um, as a 17 half year old boy, that's a good win. Um, so uh, we're certainly happy with that. Um, and just one quick question that was on Explorer from someone. Um, he does eat quite well. He has great teeth. Uh, he can chew chicken bones with no problems. Yeah, that's a, a common ailment for older animals. Um, even our domestic um, you know, domestic dogs suffer from significant tooth wear in their old age. So great to hear that that Grizzer is um, doing well, at least in that yeah. regard. And you have a, a couple of other wolves from a different subspecies. Um, there are almost, they're not quite pure white in, in their fur color, but pretty close. Um, and that's Axel and Grayson. They're an Arctic subspecies. So uh, what's, uh, what's their story? Um, uh, can you talk a little bit about the lives of an Arctic wolf? Sure. So being up in a harsh, harsher climate, um, there is an adaptation of their body to be a little bit shorter, uh, you know, less uh, surface area, less veins to the surface area um, to avoid uh, losing heat. Ears are cupped more. Ears are, are, are shorter than you might see on some of the other subspecies. A lot more hair, a little bit. They look a little bit stockier, a little bit shorter. You know, again, Rika does too, but she's, you know, only only seven months old. Uh, but um, um, so those are all adaptations. But obviously, you really see the camouflage in the subspecies. You know, if you're going to stalk and you're going to, you know, uh, pounce on your prey, it's best that you uh, blend in with the background environment. So it doesn't take much to really understand the comprehension of these are a northern species that have snow in their you know environment uh, you know uh, multiple year months out of a year and grayson and axel are, are their brothers from the same litter uh, but like all siblings they definitely seem to show some differences in their behaviors i know people would not describe me to behave in the same way as as my brother so how would you describe the differences in the personalities and, and dispositions between grace grayson and axel Sure. Uh, most Explore.org viewers really can see the difference, and actually that's how they tell them apart. Um, Grayson's extremely tolerant of Rika. He's uh, very, uh, 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 I wouldn't say protective, that's a human term, but certainly watches out for her. Uh, Axel is is very gregarious, and he is roughhousing and jaw sparring and jumping. And so there's different levels of temperament, and there's different levels of dominance. Um, so you can see Axel with his tail up, grabbing, trying to kind of push his way on Grayson. This is all ritualized dominance. They say that wolves actually do ritualized dominance to avoid uh, fights uh, that are more significant, meaning if everybody knows their place in the pack, then certainly um, there's no question about it. But the addition of Rika has certainly changed the dynamics between these two brothers. So we're starting to see a lot of that happening as winter progresses. And let's talk a little bit more about Rika, who's the newest member of your ambassador pack at the International Wolf Center. Uh, she was born in, in May, 2021. So it's not very old right now. Well, where does uh, Rika trace her lineage from and what might define her subspecies um, compared to other other wolves? Sure. Uh, Rika is a northwestern subspecies and actually she came from a facility that acquired her wild caught parents, meaning both of her parents were uh, pups in packs up in British Columbia um, as part of the British Columbia government um, management of uh, reducing wolf populations in favor of caribou herds. Uh, the pups are typically not eliminated in that kind of calling of the, of the, of the wolf population. So the pups came into captivity. Um, they were bred in captivity and uh, Rika was a product of that breeding. Um, so she traces right back to BC, northern BC, um, north of 53 latitude, uh, 52 and 53 latitude. So that's pretty far up north. And um, I, I think what to me was striking about the Northwestern subspecies that kind of really grizzled gray, definitely her markings are tremendous. I mean, much more distinct. And I wonder again about camouflage, if we look at the other species in camouflage, you know, I mean, you gotta really see that that rock background that in that Rocky Mountain kind of a, a, a of, of, you know, visual um, prey not seeing you coming because you blend in pretty well with the with the Rocky Mountains. And it's been a long process to introduce Rika to Axel and Grayson in your exhibit pack. I think you first uh, introduced uh, her to Axel and Grayson on August 9, if I, if my notes here that I took are, are correct. And it wasn't uh, a simple process. It's not like just 
taking a few well-mannered dogs to the dog park and be like, hey, have at it and, and have a good time. So uh, the wolves uh, at the International Wolf Center, they're socialized to people, but they're not domesticated. So I think this, this seems to pose some pretty special challenges for you when you're trying to introduce uh, a new wolf into the mix. Um, so uh, how did her age and maybe her lack of social experience around other wolves make her integration into the exhibit exhibit pack maybe different uh, from other introductions? What sort of precautions and uh, things did you have to watch for? Sure. I think yeah, so we were looking a lot. Yeah, we were looking a lot at uh, kind of her lack of, of siblings, that lack of kind of canid socialization that she had. Um, you know, she didn't have someone to wrestle with. She didn't have someone to to act like a pup with. Um, you know, we did introduce dog, a dog with her, Max. Um, he was pretty good with her. Uh, he was a little submissive. Uh, he wasn't really able to, to show her, um, you know, that ritualized dominance that adult gray wolves will show. So, um, you know, it wasn't quite what she was expecting when she went into the exhibit pack. There was a little bit of, of tension from her, a little bit of nervousness. Um, on the screen there, you can see that was her at 12 days old. Um, you know, wolves are born with their, their ears closed and their eyes shut. They're pretty altricial. They, they rely very heavily on um, their other pack mates to to survive. Um, as they get a little older, they get a little more mobile. That was her with um, Mama Jane over at the Wildlife Science Center uh, where we acquired her from. Actually went down there to do training with them, um, basic bottle feeding training, emergency situation stuff. Um, but they had a really great cast of dogs that um, have raised pups in the past and will continue to do so. Um, when she came here to the International Wolf Center, uh, we did raise her indoors as would be, you know, her life in a den in the wild, um, just to protect her from those outside elements, the extreme heat, extreme cold, the rain. Um, however, she would go outside pretty often for her public programs. Um, we wanted to get her used to live in life outdoors because that's, that's where she's going to live. That's where she's going to spend the rest of her life. Um, so we started that pretty early on. Um, from that point she was introduced into the pack like you said on august 9th at around three months of age um after many public programs um those those public programs helped that socialization um and helped her get used to being around people watching people in the windows um and pretty quickly on uh, she and grayson started to form a relationship um as as pack mates uh, he was a lot better with her, a lot more kind of respectful of her space. Um, and she was, she began to do the one, uh, doing the chasing there, as you can see in the video. Um, you know, she really kind of saw him as, as her pack mate. Um, and later on, once Rika started to see that Axel wasn't quite as scary as he made himself out to be, um, you know, she started to bond with him a little bit too. Most of that bonding was through play. So uh, we see that today up until about probably a month ago is when she started really engaging with Axel, really starting to do those, those big play behaviors to kind of strengthen their bond. Um, however, it's still kind of Grayson that she, she rests with at night and that's kind of the, the wolf she kind of gravitates towards to a little more it seems, so. And yeah, since, um... You know, you had those those two wolves already on the exhibit, you know, Axel and Grayson. Uh, you know, it, it seems like space and pack territory size um, influences dominance maybe in, in wild wolves. So how uh, did you adapt your care of wolves to adjust for that? And sort of a related question coming in from the audience, somebody was wondering, how is it even possible to create a pack out of a bunch of random and unrelated wolves? So um, maybe if you could just elaborate a little bit about pack and territory size and, and how you're adjusting um, for the needs of a wolf in that, in that regard. Sure, I can kind of take that one. Um, it's interesting because I've, I've had a lot of um, history of doing radio telemetry and um, being able to uh, monitor wolf pack size. Wolf pack size in the wild is strongly influenced by prey availability. Um, I was radio tracking a pack near my house that didn't go more than two miles away from the dump because that's where they got their food. And so size of territories in the wild is about food source. And so here in captivity, obviously food source is provided. So then we work on not so much territorial issues, uh, but we work on the social dynamics. And first of all, wolves are social. The fact that you have a dog who is your best friend is because it evolved 
from a social pack animal. It's in their DNA to socially bond. It was been there the day that Rika showed up. Grayson planted himself outside that gate, watched for her, bark howled when she wasn't there, you know, stressed out when other people touched her. He um, um, you know, kind of showed that dominance, that that's what wolves are. So it's not unusual that they can and will, um, you know, interact. As a matter of fact, there's research on wild wolf projects taking uh, pups born in captivity and fostering them with uh, wild wolves to be able to improve genetic diversity in the wild. So it's, it's part of the wolf's DNA. So uh, we let the wolves do some of it. Uh, we do a lot. Uh, we spend a lot of hours in there making sure that everybody's needs are met. And then um, we also rely on a natural hormone called prolactin um, that um, arrives sometime in April, starts to kind of wane in August. So that's why, you know, Wolf's Care staff are really monitoring what's going on and making sure that things are good. And somebody was wondering, um, and I guess this is kind of related to my next question, but um, about how many acres is um, is your site where you have um, your wolves, and and how do you work with the wolves to reduce tensions? I know that was something that you mentioned is something that you you really try to pay attention to, uh, but uh, they they don't have as many maybe outlets to release stress as a wild pack. So how are you reducing uh, tensions in that sense, and how much space do the sure. animals have? Um, so the um, so the size of our facility is 12 acres, but a majority of that is obviously in in building and parking lot. Um, so uh, we're roughly running about two acres uh, with all compounds that includes retirement and the exhibit as well as protective fences. Um, there's part of this uh, facility that um, still has snow compacted that that they don't you know travel in much. I mean their um, socialization for these wolves is about. Um, the human component. So they're very keyed into the front of the exhibit. Um, we manage stress. And again, stress is, is uh, something that we monitor. We uh, train our staff to be able to identify um, what are stressors, what are the behavioral cues that show an animal's in stress. Uh, we do a lot of distractions, um, deer hides and deer legs and, um, you know, food resources, but not just food resources, um, you know, things that um, you know, that, that they can um, engage with, you know. So, like I said, the hide isn't a food, but it sure is a lot of fun. Uh, turkey feathers were a great thing. Uh, Rika loved having turkey feathers. Um, so those are really important. Uh, but the biggest stressor for even socialized wolves is the human component. So we're very protective about, you know, not letting people next to the fence. Uh, we, we really don't do a lot of behind-the-scenes work in um, the winter because, and, you know, the seasonal hormones of wolves means that by December, January, they get real tense about strangers. Uh, lots more stranger danger going on right now um, than they are. So, so including wild wolves, if you look at biggest stresses wild wolves have is the human component around their territory. And you've, you know, been watching and the webcam viewers have been watching very closely the behavior of Axel and Grayson and Rika in your exhibit pack. So how ca how have the webcam viewers helped you to document the behavior between those three animals? Well, Abby can... Um, yeah, can, I can take can, that one, Lori. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm on Explorer pretty often. Um, every morning, one of the first things I do is to check the comments, see where Rika was sleeping the last night, see where the boys were, check on on how Grizzer's doing. A lot of times they'll they'll post photos of our own cameras on our website uh, that has Grizzer's retirement um, habitat in those. So um, yeah, that's one of the first things I do. I like to know what's going on. If, if there's something that the... Um, explore commenters are worried about. I like to kind of respond to that right away. If it's something that I'm also worried about, uh, then we can go in, we can check it out. We can see how the wolves are doing. Um, you know, it's been, it's been very valuable to have kind of extra, extra sets of eyes to keep an eye on them. Um, you know, we are here, you know, eight, nine, 10 hours a day, but, um, you wow. know, we're not here overnight. So, and we're not able to watch them all day because we're doing programs or we're doing, um, you know, things with the public. So um, it's very helpful to have have extra eyes on the wolves. And what's really nice about the gallery too is because it gives us a time and then we were able to go back in and replay video. Abby you know, frequently captures video uh, you know, uh, that we can 
take a look at the gallery and just you say, oh, that image, that looks like an interesting behavior. Let's go back and let's play a sequence of that and see what led up to it. You know, we've had wild wolves around the facility. Anytime we feed, it's like a buffet table. So whether they smell the carcass or whether they hear the ravens who are frequent visitors to this, um, we do know that wolf presence increases with our feeding programs. And so having that opportunity to, um, you know, be able to uh, you know, hear in the middle of the night. And we have many viewers um, who are not in our time zone. We really appreciate the viewers, you know, from the other side of the pond um, or across the, across the globe who uh, can watch when we're not here. And I think that's a big advantage to having webcams um, compared to a more sort of like traditional means of, of experiencing uh, wildlife. Um, and um, and I think that's a great thing that Explore helps to provide people all over the world. Uh, and we do have um, a bunch of questions coming in from the audience, and we're going to try to get to a few of those um, in just a, a few minutes here. But uh, you know, we you have four wolves um, at the International Wolf Center from different subspecies. Uh, but in, in so there are examples of that. But going back to sort of like the idea of the different types of wolves across North America, I'm wondering how might we use our expanding ability to monitor wild wolves and analyze their genes you know what might that illuminate about um, the science of wolf conservation and how valuable is that information well i'd like to just really address there was just something that came out um, just this past month from voyagers national park up in the canadian border here um, just the presence of documentation of black color phase uh, wolves with a black color phase that, um, you know, previous science and here in Minnesota where there has been a long, you know, wolves were never extirpated from Minnesota, meaning that they were always here um, in the, even the prior to the protection, uh, conservation officers that bounty, that, that managed bounty wolves, there were very, very few black wolves here. Now Voyagers has identified through the use of trail cameras, an entire pack, all but one is black. And so, so that's led to some interesting discussion about genetics. So I think um, a visual, obviously Yellowstone, having that opportunity to see wolves directly. Um, uh, here in Minnesota, you really can't see wolves very well. I mean, they're elusive, they're forested, we're a dense forest environment. Um, so having those trail cams up at Voyagers has really been uh, an added uh, bonus to the science of, of, of understanding wolves. And obviously they uh, look at pup survival. So they'll all cameras up and they'll see six pups at the den and then you know three months later here comes four you know or two and there's a good indication of survival um, and we need to know those things in order to understand wolf conservation and why it might it be important to gain a greater understanding though of, of the genetic diversity in, in wild wolves i mean we've spent a ton of time talking about that um, but I'm sure uh, folks at home, um, and myself included, are are curious about what you think about that. Why why should we really kind of focus on the genetic diversity of wild wolves? Well, I think if you look at Isle Royale, which um, had a circumstance where it was a, a, a pair that had crossed the ice in the 40s, and that population couldn't sustain itself with inbreeding, you know, having genetic diversity, having travel corridors, having wolves to be able to leave one population and disperse to another population without the risk of being killed, you know, to be able to spread, uh, to get new new blood and to be able to diversify that gene pool so that they're healthier. You know, that's, I think that's a real important part. You, you know, even in Yellowstone, um, there's an initiative, Yellowstone to Yukon, you know, trying to have contiguous wildlands to be able to get from one part of wolf range to another part of wolf range without overcoming, uh, having those wolves, you know, be, be eliminated as they trans travel um, through more human uh, dominated landscapes. I think that's the key to not just wolves, but large carnivore management. And you've both worked with um, and, and studied wolves for, for many years. Uh, so before we get to audience questions, I am curious, what do you, what do you enjoy most uh, about that work? And, uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, I'd just be happy to, happy to hear what you have to say about that. Abby, you want to go first? Sure, absolutely. Um, I guess one of my favorite things is just being able to be closer to these animals that you know are very elusive, very, they're very secretive, 
Um, like Lori mentioned, a lot of what we know about them is through trail cameras, is through radio tracking and radio collaring. Um, so it's not very often that you get to see them in person. So being able to work with them in a way that is um, a lot more personable, I think you can learn a lot more about the animal um, by being able to observe these behaviors in person, up close and personal. Um, so yeah, it's been kind of my favorite thing about working, working at the Wolf Center. Um, you know, I've, I've worked with wolves uh, collaring and trapping out of Duluth, Minnesota, and um, something about just being able to see them, see them in person and uh, kind of get a better sense of, of what they are in the wild has been, been pretty cool. I'll, I'll, I'll be brief. I know that's hard to believe. <laughs> but uh, uh, for me, I think there's two things. One is everybody knows wolves kill. Everybody knows wolves are predators. But I see it over and over again, even on Explore.org comments that, oh, they're just like a dog or, that, or, that's, or they're acting just like my dog. You know what? Your dogs are acting like wolves. Wolves are the original social carnivore. And so having that opportunity to, to, to get to know that personality and to see that personality is just tremendous honor to be able to work with these animals. But the other thing that was really kind of keyed into me uh, a year ago, uh, Ralph Peterson at Isle Royale sent me a picture he saw from the plane. Um, and he said, what do you think this wolf is doing? And I said, I have the exact same photo of a, of a yearling wolf testing a dominant wolf. And I said, this is the same face and this is the same behavior. And I said, yep, that looks like what a yearling would do. And so it, it was having that opportunity to experience the behaviors of the wolves in captivity and to be able to see that that same personality does exist in the wild. Yeah, it's a remarkable window, I think, into into their behaviors. Even even though they are or they are captive, they're still wolves. They're still doing wolfy things uh, out there. Um, so yeah, thanks for those answers. Uh, we do have a few viewer questions that we're going to try to get to uh, for the final few minutes of our conversation. Um, and and Laura, you were just mentioning, um, you know, uh, how we can learn from uh, you know the captive wolves and extrapolate maybe some of that behavior and and learn more about wild wolves in that sense but there was a video clip somebody was wondering about um, that they they saw on the cams at least where uh, let's say it says uh, Rika grabbed one of the Arctic's tails didn't let go mm -hmm. pulled and pulled not sure if it was actual or Grayson but whoever it was let her do it for quite a while what was that about so i don't know if you were able to see that or maybe you could share a little bit of insight into the behavior of the wolves at that time yeah she was pulling grayson's tail grayson was engaged in a dominant posture with axel he didn't want to give up his his position um he was uh in a standoff with axel and she um she's a pup she wants to play like abby said she doesn't have a litter mate to rough house with and that's who she's living with and so um and grayson um um you know just happened to be right there but but it did show the intensity of um of the posturing that's going on between those two males as they just try to figure out who's going to lead this pack and who's going to pair bond with rika um you know rika is just young she she's just young she's a young pup doing whatever young pups do but to grayson and axel it's serious business about who is going to be the more dominant of the two brothers and we, you know, a lot of our um, conversation today ended up uh, discussing, of course, the ge the genetics of wolves. Um, it seems like every time uh, the genetics of wolves come up, there's questions about like wolf and dog hybrids or wolf and coyote hybrids, uh, for instance. And somebody was actually wondering a little bit about that. Uh, can and will wolves breed with um, many different types of dogs, or is it just kind of some that they'll do that, or? Uh, can you even really expect that to happen very much? Um, or would a wolf rather prefer to be with a wolf um, compared to a domestic dog? I guess that's a follow-up question that I have. Well, in the wild, um, dogs are viewed as competitors. And so um, actually, in, in uh, I believe in Colorado had its first uh, livestock and dog kill. Um, so um, in a newly formed population there. Um, the other thing too, is that wolves are not reproductive in the same way that dogs are. Dogs reproduce any time of the year um, can come into heat um, and be fertile any time of the year. Wolves have a seasonal cycle that doesn't start until like February, and even males aren't even fertile um, during that off cycle. Females only come into heat during that winter season. So it's really a different dynamics. Um, more often than not, wild wolves are, are attacking or 
showing territorial response to dogs running amok rather than um, looking to breed with them. But they can breed in captivity. There's no doubt. Um, and that's how hybrids are created. Um, it's not as likely that hybrids in the wild are from offspring, with the exception of some research in Italy where there has been mixing of, of feral dogs with wolves. Um, and then uh, there have been some hybridization there, but um, a definitely a unique situation. And Abby, you talked uh, uh, at the beginning of the chat a little bit about um, the sort of different proportions of coyote genes in in the wolves uh, throughout North America. Somebody was wondering, and I don't know if you have an answer for this or not, but somebody was wondering where the highest concentration of um, what you could consider to be like a coyote wolf hybrid in North America to be, or even if is there such a, a, a true thing such as that, or are we looking at more of like just a, a broad, broad mix, um, and it's really hard to 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 differentiate whether you're looking at like a, a pure wolf coyote hybrid or or some other mixture? Sure, sure. You know, that's a really good question. Um, in general, koi wolves aren't really a huge thing in, in the wild. Um, you know, wolves and coyotes, they don't get along. Uh, wolves will go after coyotes, they will kill coyotes, they will mm -hmm. run them off, and they typically don't want to breed with coyotes. Mm -hmm. um, in the places where it does happen, um, you know, I've heard of places in the east just because of the smaller body size of, say, the red wolf or the eastern wolf. Um, I would say that's probably where you see a little bit more of the potential for hybridization. Um, definitely, I think that's probably what caused that um, increased amount of ancestral um, coyote DNA in those species and subspecies is their smaller body size. Maybe they're a little more willing to kind of co-mingle, um, but where you see, you know, those Northwestern subspecies, they're not going to be, you know, kind of interacting with the, those coyotes um, in any other way, but running them off or, or killing them. So. The only other thing I wanted to add to is keep in mind DNA. This could have been historically a significant period of time. Um, in the past, mm -hmm. um, wolves mm -hmm. were bountied from really the 1600s in the East Coast until the 1970s, where they were eliminated here in Minnesota or reduced in Minnesota. So a lot of this gene swapping may have occurred because of culling of gray wolf populations, where they're you know where it's different than today, where there's a, a you know a population of gray wolves and there's coyotes, they're going to be more territorial. But when you cull a population as extensively as wolves have been extirpated in the United States, in, in the lower 48 especially, um, there's bound to be opportunities for hybridization. And so I think a lot of the, when you look at DNA, you just can't say it happened this week. You know, um, you know we're talking that that could have been um, a result of the bounty that started in the 1600s. And Lori, before the, before the chat began, you and I are actually talking a little bit about, um, you know, wolves expanding their range into different parts of, of North America after, you know, their ranges were restricted due to persecution. And somebody was asking if you had any thoughts about um, a wolf that traveled into California and it was hit and killed by a vehicle last year. Uh, so uh, what, do you, what do you think about uh, wolves and their ability to reclaim um, sort of like their traditional territories in California? And, um, and elsewhere in North America? Or should we be a bit more proactive and this person is wondering and reintroduce wolves into certain places like they had done in Yellowstone in the 1990s? Wolves are, are, are amazing resi resilient. Um, even in captivity, I, I see resilience in their tolerances for pain, their tolerances for you know um, things that, 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 that dogs couldn't stand. So we always, I, I, yeah, I, I, you know, to me, it's the opportunity to tr to travel. I mean, do they have the corridors that they can get there safely? Are they not? If we have laws that they are not persecuted, not illegally shot, um, they have the opportunity. You know, to some extent, it's the natural world. Are you going to be more resilient because you got there on your own, and you've had to overcome so many things? Survival of the fittest would tell you that maybe that you're a superior gene that you would pass on um, by getting there on your own. Um, so I I think. If we respect our laws that we have in this country and we allow opportunities for uh, wolves to be protected in areas where their population is not recovered, um, certainly dispersal is a natural process of wolves and, and they've proven they can get there as long as they are not, as you said, illegally shot. You know, they have that opportunity. 
And uh, one final audience question for you, and this is actually kind of related to my, my last question uh, for the both of you. Are wolves in America threatened or are they doing well? And then uh, my follow-up to that is, what can people at home do to protect wild wolves? Abby, you want to take that or? Yeah, I can do that one. So, sure. um, you know, that's a, that's a, you know, kind of difficult question. Um, if you look at gray wolves around the world, they're doing fine. You know, they're, they're very populous. They're found pretty much all over the Northern hemisphere. Um, pretty decent population sizes. They're, they're not, they're not threatened uh, globally. Um, in North America, if you look at, um, you know, their historical range, you know, you could argue that, you know, they, they are threatened. They're still having, having issues recolonizing to their historical range. Um, but you also got to think about the um, cultural carrying capacity of the species. So what the, the culture, what um, us as humans can allow for uh, their population to be. Um, you know, we have expanded quite a bit in North America. There's a lot of land, or there's not a lot of land left uh, for wildlife, um, other than a lot of national parks, a lot of, um, you know, national forests, uh, protected land that, um, that seems to be where wolves do a lot better, uh, is those, those wildland areas um, away from humans, away from urbanization. Um, and there's just not a lot of that left. So, you know, there's not really a lot of spaces for wolves to live um, where you're not going to have that conflict with with people. So, you know, it's kind of kind of coming to that point where um, what is the cultural capacity of, of wolves in North America? And I would just add, you know, people, if people paying attention to wildlands is huge. I think wolves can, can help themselves if they have opportunities, space, food, water, cover. Those are the four components to habitat. And without them, you know, you can't live. And we as humans are the same. Well, thanks for sharing your, uh, your thoughts today. Uh, sorry that we couldn't get to all of our audience questions, mm -hmm. but thanks for everyone who submitted questions uh, for the chat today. Um, and it's been a, a fun conversation. Um, my uh, guests today have been Lori Schmidt and Abby Keller from the International Wolf Center in Minnesota. If you want to learn more about their wolves, um, you can just go um, to explore.org slash wolf. Um, you can watch the wolves right there. They also have an, uh, the International Wolf Center also has an excellent YouTube channel if you want to learn more about what their wolves are doing. Um, I, I, I looked at a lot of their videos in preparation for this live chat. Um, so check that out as well and their website wolf.org uh, so Lori, abby thanks so much for being here today thanks for having us and we'll uh, see you thank online you, mike. and my name is mike fitz with explore.org uh, thanks for joining me today and remember as we like to say at explore never stop learning <laughs>